So therefore, you don't have to be surprised if you look the Indonesian friend having two cell phone in their pocket. So if 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 you look at that, that the problem now is the network of smartphone, the quality is among the lowest in Asia Pacific region. This is due to the unavailability of fixed broadband network, so that the mobile network, including 3G, is not working properly. Another challenge faced by Indonesia is use the internet is still focused on purpose of economic activity, mostly in the early stage. So only pleasure of entertainment, so they don't get the economic value. On this challenge, stakeholders involved in the provision and trying to formulate program in the critters of economic. So for this session, actually, if I may share the experience of Indonesia, the multi-stakeholder multi model cooperation in Indonesia should have preference over other country, because this spirit has already regulated in law number 36, year 1999, on the role of telecommunication has been set up a setting telecommunication policy, namely Article 5 which is here is said that community participation in the form of delivering of thought is welcome and implementation of community participation was organized by an independent body established for that purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, so I don't want to take long for the introduction and I would like to invite our moderator for this session, Mr. Adil Akplogan, he is the CEO of AfriNik. Please take a chair. With your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, just a few words on what has been put up on the screen. Okay. The uh, CSTD Working Group on IGF Improvements recommended that each ses session address policy questions. Okay. And we have issued a call for public input, and these questions, uh, can you, Secretary, please put them up on the screen again? They are, should guide our discussions, but of course the moderators are also free to okay. ask other questions, but they are kindly requested to guide the discussions in a way that we answer the questions and have a sort of tangible outcome after this session. And I express my hope that it should be possible for this session to have some kind of agreement on what are the important principles for multi-stakeholder cooperation I see the IGF very much as the home of multi-stakeholder cooperation. From here, it's spread to many other organizations, and I think time has come to take ownership for the IGF of this term. Now, please, both moderators, Matthew Shears and Adiel, who wants to start, please. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, and thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> I think this session is a, is a very important session in the context of this uh, IGF. Uh, if you have been familiar with IGF, the word multi-stakeholder or multi-stakeholderism come very often. And uh, if you have followed the previous session in, in internet governance principle, multi-stakeholder come again. Um, in this session, particularly what we, we are going to try to do is to kind of define what are the key principles uh, which make a, a forum, a uh, policy-making uh, process or any governance process multi-stakeholder. What are the principles that we have to, 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 to look at? Uh, when, when we talk about um, um, multi-stakeholder uh, or multi-stakeholderism, it, it doesn't only um, address just internet governance, but we're talking about multi-stakeholder in anything that requests cooperation, anything that requests attention to deal with complex issue in general. So how do we lay down those principles so that we can easily apply them, translate them in addressing uh, such uh, an issue? How can we tap on experience from different stakeholders, civil society, private sector, government, into, <clears throat> into dealing with those complex issues. Uh, because when, when, when we, we start looking deeply at multi-stakeholderism and applying it to different sectors, 
applying it in different regions, applying it in different countries, it may have uh, some variances. But what we want to do uh, is to find a common ground, the common denominator for this multi-stakeholderism so that we can properly evaluate its application in the day-to-day, -day, evaluate its impact on dealing with those uh, complex issues. So this, this session will give us the opportunity uh, uh, to challenge what we understand by, by multi-stakeholderism, converge our view on some of the key principles as um, already um, um, explored by, by different, different people. We mainly want to make this session very interactive. Uh, we don't have panel. It's not a session with, with panelists. But uh, we all in the room uh, are, are part of the panel. Uh, we will expect contribution from, from everybody. Uh, we'll hear from a few discussants who will present uh, their view, their work on multi-stakeholderism. And we'll try uh, after that to have uh, a kind of brainstorming session to converge those, those ideas to, to key, key points. Um, the session will have four different elements, and I will uh, ask Matthew to give us um, uh, more detail about those four, four elements of the session. Thanks. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Matthew Shears with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, before I get into what the goals of this session is, uh, we have a number of open seats around uh, this table. Uh, if anybody would, I would encourage you to come forward to sit at the table. Uh, there are microphones here that will facilitate participation. We should also have a roving mic, so uh, anybody who wants to contribute, and we encourage you all to contribute, please raise your hands and we'll make sure that you have an opportunity to do so. Okay? So the goals of this session are three part. Um, one is to identify key multi-stakeholder principles, and for doing that, we'll be reviewing the work that's been done so far. Um, we'll be asking, as Adiel said, some discussants to speak to the work they've been doing on multi-stakeholder principles. The second part will be to look at, in very practical terms, what are some of the challenges that we face in implementing multi-stakeholderism in policy development processes, and how have we overcome those challenges? So for those of you in the audience who have had practical experience of working in multi-stakeholder environments or in putting multi-stakeholder policy processes in place, we would very much like to hear from you. And then the third part is, how do we promote multi-stakeholderism? How do we take this concept forward? How do we ensure that it is implemented in other fora at the national regional and international levels. So those are the three goals of the session. Um, as I said, it'll be, uh, we encourage everybody to, to chime in. Um, if there are principles that we've uh, gone through and you feel there are principles that are missing, we want to hear about them. Um, and the more practical and uh, that we can get, the better. I would note that we have had a, an hour and a half on internet governance experience and principles. So what I would really encourage us to do is to really Let's get, let's get down into the weeds. Let's talk about how you actually implement multi-stakeholderism and let's, let's talk about what some of the learnings are so we can make this as, as useful an output for the IGF as possible. So with that said, um, I'll just, opening the first part of the discussion, I'd just like to review a little bit what work has been done uh, in the context of the IGF working group on multi-stakeholder principles. Um, and as you may know or may not know, the uh, working group has uh, done three things so far, one of which is to compile a set of existing sets of principles and to take a look at those uh, existing principles and also the outputs of workshops that have been undertaken at UNESCO and elsewhere to re look at multi-stakeholder principles. Um, there's also been um, a, a process to kind of draw from those sets of principles, what are the key common principles, if you will, and I'll come to those in a minute. And this, this, this goal is to facilitate this discussion. This is not to say that these particular principles which I will highlight are the principles, but rather something from which we can take our discussion forward. And when I've introduced those, then we'll go to the discussants we've identified and ask them to tell us about the work they've been doing in, in terms of different multi-stakeholder principles, and particularly to talk about 
um, how, those, uh, how that work is being taken forward. So anyway, in the review work that's been undertaken to date within the IGF, Working Group on Multi-Stakeholder Principles, the following, and unfortunately I'm not sure we can put them up, but I'll read them out, the following uh, principles have been identified. The first is open and inclusive processes. The second is engagement, in other words, processes enabling all stakeholders to engage and to participate. The third is participation and contribution, meaning the ability to participate in and contribute to decision making. The fourth is transparency in processes and decision making and how decisions made and input is reflected. And the last is accountability. In other words, mechanisms for checks and balances in decision making and a consensus-based approach for decision making reflecting how input from the multi-stakeholder processes are incorporated. So again, let me just repeat those principles that, were, that have been drawn from the work of the IGF working group. So it's open and inclusive processes, engagement, participation and contribution, transparency, accountability, and decision-making, consensus-based decision-making. Now, what I, with that in mind, and that's not to say that those are the principles, we would welcome a discussion of that, but what we'd like to do is let uh, uh, four or five discussants go first, dis review their own multi, the work they've been doing on multi-stakeholder principles, and then we'd like to open it to the floor and, um, and engage in an open discussion about the principles that we will have mentioned and other ones that may be missing or um, still... Um, still not accounted for. Yes, we, we will try and get them up on the screen as we proceed. So, um, we'd like to call on Aisha Hassan with ICC basis if she could, no mic. Let's see if we can track down a microphone. Aisha, why don't, why don't you come? Is there a mic that you can sit at? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Aisha Hassan for ICC Basis. Um, at the February UNESCO hosted WSIS Plus 10 review event in Paris, we organized, facilitated a discussion on multi stakeholder principles. Um, we had some lead discussants from business, civil society, uh, academics, and, and uh, governments. So, from that discussion, we identified a few recommendations that came out of it. Um, one was, I would say, that the principles, Matthew, that you've outlined are things that were an integral, integral part of the discussion, clearly identified. Um, in the discussion, fundamental design and operational principles, meaning uh, there are some fundamental operational principles that constitute multi-stakeholder approaches and processes. Um, so that was drilling down into some of the things that you've identified, but also talking about bottom-up agenda setting and due process, um, how to progress the engagement of stakeholders, what are the obstacles to participation, uh, things like that. And Another thing that was clarified was that there is a difference between governance of and governance on the Internet. Um, we also talked about challenges of multi-stakeholder formats and uh, how these formats can be used to address key policy issues and decision-making beyond consultations or meetings. Um, some of these challenges were balancing geographical representation, how to build capacity to promote effective participation, uh, the role of steering groups or advisory groups, uh, the risks of capture, management of conflicts of interest, uh, and general legitimacy of the overall process. We also talked about um, evolving mechanisms for the multi-stakeholder model, uh, things, how can you put in place processes that will adequately address concrete problems, um, 
We also delved into the respective roles of stakeholders within a multi-stakeholder process and, and how that affects discussion, the different weights of different topics and the roles of different stakeholders within them. Um, so with that, that was a, a, a very good facilitated discussion at that event in February and since then we have uh, put in, we will have a workshop tomorrow with the Internet Society, APC, the Government of Brazil, and ICC BASIS, also with a multi-stakeholder panel, uh, hopefully building upon the session we're having today. And again, our starting point will be to listen here today and try to drill down further. Um, the workshop is also going to try to focus on de-jargonizing the terms. What do we really mean when we're saying open? What do we really mean when we say participation? Uh, what is inclusion? And uh, we hope that that will be a, a good building block from what comes out of today's focus session. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, in the interest of interactivity, I don't know if anybody has some immediate responses to Aisha and her, her comments. Any immediate responses or questions? Okay, then um, let us proceed. Um, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Professor Riglio Almeida um, with the CGBR, the coordinator for the CGBR, if he's here. Oh, we'll come back to him in a little, li in a little bit. Um, I was hoping Joy uh, Lidicote from APC could talk a little bit about the uh, draft Best Bits multi-stakeholder work that the civil society has been working on. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Joy Lidicote from APC for the record. Um, yes, what I can certainly do is share with you a discussion which is in progress, um, which hasn't been concluded yet, but which... Uh, has been quite useful, I think, among the civil society groups that are part of the Best Bits um, Coalition. And we convened a meeting before the IGF uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, day minus one and minus two of the IGF. And uh, part of that discussion consisted of uh, an open um, dialogue about the definition of multi-stakeholderism, what is it, um, an exchange of ideas and concepts, and from that uh, we distilled both some points of commonality and also dissonance in, in our understanding. So I'm happy to share those with you. I see there are some of my other colleagues from uh, Best Bits here, so obviously um, they can input, correct me if I'm wrong, add depth as they see fit. Um, so essentially in terms of defining um, what multi-stakeholderism or multi-stakeholder processes might be. Um, there was a very strong uh, feeling, uh, sense that multi-stakeholder uh, processes are a form of achieving participatory democracy in internet governance. They don't conflict with the concepts of democratic participation, but rather um, it's just one other form of democracy. That uh, multi-stakeholder processes uh, are focused on giving voice social justice and are very much therefore linked to processes of democratic participation. That multi-stakeholder processes uh, are iterative uh, with a core concept around transparency and documenting both consensus and disagreement. There was some debate about whether the term multi-stakeholderism is appropriate uh, because it elevates um, uh, the concept to an ideology and the, the other forms of ism, such as sexism or, or other uh, communism or other kinds of um, concepts which we didn't really feel that multi-stakeholder processes uh, were akin to. Uh, it's some interesting debate about that. Um, and that also there are no fixed um, stakeholders, that there is a fluid notion that stakeholders may come together and form around and cluster around different issues and topics and should not be defined um, uh, for all time and all, and all issues, which we think was important. In terms of multi-stakeholder principles, we just distill um, several. Um, the first cluster was around participation, uh, that multi-stakeholder models should lead real participation, taking into account that there aren't decision-making outcomes, but that it is more than the concept of mere consultation. Um, 
uh, concept that there is a right for people to participate in governance processes uh, that they have a stake in, um, that openness and transparency were other key words here. Uh, and that this was a standard that civil society should apply to itself as well. Um, that, uh, in, in a similar way, under participation, that um, policy choices should be explained, should be justified, um, particularly from a, multi, a public interest viewpoint. Um, the second core principle related to accountability and transparency uh, in other words, as civil society, that we as civil society should ensure this accountability and transparency ourselves, but that also as stakeholders we do need common understandings of what we mean by these concepts, um, bearing in mind that forms of accountability for government may be different from the forms of accountability for private sector or, or civil society, but that nonetheless accountability is important. Um, and also the responsibilities of participants in multi-stakeholder processes to be informed and to have the necessary skills and be supported um, in capacity development. The third principle was around, somewhat inelegantly framed but was around changing power imbalances. Uh, that in other words modalities of process must ensure that civil society groups have uh, a meaningful um, equal stake and equal um, participation uh, in internet governance processes. Uh, and that there is, a, sorry, a fourth principle was procedural fairness. And a fifth one was diversity. Um, diversity of uh, viewpoints, including um, not only those who are at the table, but the range of viewpoints on and under discussion. Um, in terms of uh, other clusters of process-related internet governance principles, there was also an agreement that participants are working to some collective goal or common purpose, uh, that there are um, documents and materials are available online, that uh, there is an openness and that all parties can see those, and principles of, of respect and dignity in terms of how processes are conducted. So I'd, I'd stop there and just, as I say, those are uh, working notes from a discussion which is not yet concluded, but we'll share those in the spirit of, of, of facilitating your discussions. Thank you very much for those points. Um, I think next uh, we will hear from uh, Nena. Uh, she will give us perspective from um, the regional IGF, which had laid down some principle as well. Uh, so Nena. Good morning. Um, now my boss is here. That's the man over there in the cup. His name is Mark Fai. He works at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and he's actually the Africa IGF because he is the one doing the work at the Secretariat, which is being hosted by UNECA and the AU. Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to respond in a slightly different way, which will be my summary and understanding based on experience, having gone through the national, the sub-regional, and the continental. Um, I've organized the, the Côte d'Ivoire IGF, the West Africa IGF, and have been volunteering on the Africa IGF. Um, I would like to share the following. Number one point is shoot at, on the top and dig below. Shoot at the very top and dig as deep as you can. That means that we need all partners on board. In Africa, we need everyone from the AU Commission to the person on the street. It's very important that we involve everyone and give information on time. We have had issues with inform people not getting important information on the time they need it. So one thing I will put in here will be about sharing information and sharing it on time. And in a language that people understand. There is something called IGF speak. You send a letter that the WIG gig has been, has been convened by ITU and MS will be speaking with the AFRINIC chair. 
That is I, pure IGF speak. Nobody understands whether MS means multi-stakeholder or it means Matthew shares. But actually, in this case, I'm talking about Matthew shares who will be speaking with Afrinic, chair, Afrinic CEO. Nobody, just say Adiel. You know, so we need to give information in the language that people understand. And not just in the speak, but in Africa, we speak English, French, um, Portuguese, Arabic. So it's very important that when we do that, we do it in language that people understand. I encourage volunteers. It's a good thing that we see it online. Encouraging volunteers. 80% um, of IGF work is done on volunteer energy. And if we cannot keep the volunteers, then we cannot keep any uh, multi-stakeholder when going. Um, the other thing is remote participation because that allows people who may not have the funding to be in place or people who are held for one or two other reasons to still be able to participate. And be flexible on dates and agree on them. Um, in Nairobi, when we looked at the dates, because we have national IGF, we have sub-regional, and then we have the regional, we decided it was better to do the Africa one at the very end of the year, just before the global IGF, to give enough time for countries and sub-regions to pull off their own meetings. Of course, there are mailing lists. Um, we cannot run away from mailing lists. That's about the basics for communication. And um, maybe Markan will share more, but most of the people who are collaborating with the Africa IGF are from the open source world, people who are used to making open calls. It's always very important to make open calls and put them out where everyone who can have an opportunity. Um, and I will say, establish your website. I think that's one thing we took away from Nairobi. Some IGF do not have a standalone website, and it makes people a bit drawback. But when we have an IGF on its own site, it makes it easier to put all of that information. Then finally, um, I think during our own beta experience this week, this year, there was a time Makan got very angry and he wrote everybody and he said, guys, this is how much money we received. And we received this much from this person, this much from this stakeholder, this much from this stakeholder. Total this. That's all the money. So now shoot it. So I think, um, especially for us in Africa, it's very important to be very clear in money communications. Tell how much there is, where it came from, and what is being used for. It keeps everybody quiet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina, for those um, key elements that make uh, IGF successful, but also um, uh, support the multi-stakeholder in, in, in the process of IGF. Um, we now... Um, We'll now uh, listen to Professor Virgilio Almeida. He's not here. No. Marcus. Okay. So we'll hear from uh, Marcus, uh, who will give us um, Isaac perspective on, on a few of the principles that has been worked on uh, within the, the, the community. Thank you. I would actually like to pass on the ball to uh, John Kahn from uh, Aaron, he has uh, been working uh, on some of the principles we have developed and has further developed them. So, John, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you, Marcus, I think. Um, so, in looking at the question of principles um, and looking at some of the past work uh, that's happened, one of the things that we discover is that and it was mentioned in the earlier comments um, regarding uh, the basis work, we have the question of what is multi-stakeholderism and what is it distinct from how we use it with respect to Internet cooperation. And if you do a straw man, you sort of imagine that we were all here working on some other problem. We were working on... Um, uh, something like uh, the um, uh, 
uh, the, uh, m the management of the Antarctica or uh, greenhouse gases, okay? But we had a common goal and a sense of purpose, and we decided to use multi-stakeholder mechanisms for our engagement. When you do that, it actually helps us understand the difference between multi-stakeholder cooperation for internet purposes and multi-stakeholder mechanisms in general. The multi-stakeholder engagement mechanisms, we actually have a pretty good agreement on. Um, well, I don't say we have agreement. We have many people using the same words. They're actually up on those screen, uh, open and inclusive, participatory, transparency and accountability. So I actually think work on multi-stakeholder engagement independent from the internet context might be helpful because that's a more general problem which uh, would allow us to understand that, that portion very well. I'll also note there's an overlap in terms in trying to tease out some of this uh, among the work going on in some of the um, internet technical organizations. It's, it's hard to talk about accountability without talking about transparency first, because it's next to impossible to build transparency if you don't have uh, accountability without it. Uh, the same thing when you talk about openness, inclusiveness, and participation end up being a common theme. So I, I guess I don't think we're as far away as people might think. I think work in trying to figure, figure out what multi-stakeholder multi engagement mechanisms are outside of the internet context would be helpful. And then we can make using multi-stakeholder engagement one principle in how we handle internet cooperation. And then we can talk about all the other principles beyond multi-stakeholder engagement mechanisms because we understand the multi-stakeholder part so well. Thank you. Yes, just me, let me just say, if you wish to, to speak, please raise your hand. We want to, to get as many questions and comments as possible. Thank you. Uh, I'm Parminder from IT for Change. Also with the interest to make it more interactive, I thought we can kind of have a discussion going as well. And I'm very, I agree completely with John to see things uh, in certain compartments as well. And when we are talking about multi-stakeholderism outside internet governance mechanisms where it is proven and established rather well, there are some new things which we should uh, take cognizance of. And I also see in certain recent moves, including at Montevideo Statement and some other people who are aspiring to take that out to the rest of the world. And now we need to examine what does it mean here. And in the outside world, stakeholder participation has some other history, which comes from generally projects. Uh, World Bank made it famous that you are making a road somewhere. You should quickly collect people around that place and people whose livelihoods are affected or whose industries are affected and have a consultation before you finalize the project. It was a very project-related uh, idea. And as we elevate it to a form of governance, and I think then you are talking about democracy and multi-stakeholderism and what is the relationship between the two. And yesterday I heard, yes, it's just an instrument of democracy. And if it is an instrument of democracy, it should always test, test itself against democracy, which principle is that everybody should have equal political power. And therefore, each act of multi-stakeholderism or a process of multi-stakeholderism if it is an instrument of democracy, has to demonstrate that it actually increases the power of those people who don't otherwise get represented adequately in existing insufficient, inappropriate instruments of democracy. And then alone is it an instrument of democracy. So there should be a principle out there to test each method against a test of power 
imbalance, whether it actually affects the power of the marginalized groups and people in a positive manner, and then alone it contributes to democracy. And the connected point, the last principle, which is consensus-based decision-making, again, I think is a hangover from a process where it was possible to a place where it needs to be thought about. If you would have seen the latest movie on Abraham Lincoln, you would have known that slavery would not have got abolished if we were looking at consensus in that very raucous assembly uh, which uh, I saw in that movie. We need to be talking about great contestations of power. They're entrenched powers, they're people who are making claims, and consensus can be status quo in these situations. I'm not... Del I'm only saying that we need to examine, and I think we can't fix ourselves to consensus-based decision-making in general public policy areas. Thank you. Thanks, Parminda. We've got two questions, and then we'll go to our last discussant. So, uh, Nigel? Yes, thank you very much. It's <coughs> loud. Uh, Nigel Hicks and I can. I mean, j j j just a couple of points. I mean, I don't want to be too controversial, but... Uh, I, I actually think that trying to define multi-stakeholder uh, approaches can be uh, somewhat damaging. I, I, I can see the, the advantage in having principles, and I, I, in, in, indeed I think the principles that, we, uh, that uh, Matthew read out earlier are the sort of principles that one should adhere to. In, in ICANN, the multi-stakeholder process is, is, is quite complex. It's... Uh, uh, quite sophisticated how, how, how the different stakeholders interact. I'm not saying it's perfect, but uh, I think it, it, it is a process that evolves. But, I, but why I say I think we have to be careful is, is because I think although we, we should have principles that we uphold for, for what is a multi-stakeholder approach and what is not a multi-stakeholder approach, we shouldn't lock out processes that, that fall short of that necessarily. Multi-stakeholder approaches are a, it's a vehicle going forward. I mean, if we, if we look, you know, if we look back what governments did 10 or 15 years ago, then a lot of governments were in a very different position when it came to co collaboration, multi-stakeholder dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. It's a journey. And therefore, I think we have to accept that people are at different stages on the journey. And to say that that is not a process and this is a process, I think, can be dangerous. Because ultimately, I think we know where we want to go. We want to have a situation which is transparent and which upholds the principles. Sorry. Ultimately, we want a, a multi-stakeholder processes that adheres to the principles on the board, but we might not always, everyone, be at that stage at any particular time. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, we do have an issue with the transcript. I don't know if uh, we can solve that. Okay. Um, Adam, is that a note to continue? Okay. All right, Makan, would you like to uh, take the floor? Uh, thank you, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to continue on what Nena had uh, said, because in uh, the African IGF, we had uh, two sessions on uh, multi-stakeholderism. So we have some recommendations which was uh, passed and uh, I don't know, I can uh, give them now or at the end of the session if you wish so. I think it's uh, valuable to give them now if they're not too long. Okay. No, they are not too, too many. And uh, in fact, uh, what was uh, said uh, is as follows. Public participation in ICT policy processes should be open to all stakeholders and their engagement encouraged and equally valued and formalized at legislative level. And the second one, the purpose, goals, and moralities of the processes should be agreed by all stakeholders from the outset, and consultation should occur at the early stages of policy making, uh, thereby improving buy-in and implementation. Stakeholder groups should strengthen their deliberative structures and processes to be more effectively engaged at all levels, and they should also be accountable and transparent and report back to their constituencies. 
documents, proceedings and submissions should be open and readily available to the public throughout the process. Multilinguism should also be taken into account to enable everyone to communicate at ease and remote participation also should be allowed and be the norm in multi-stakeholderism. And uh, specific recommendations were uh, targeted to all the stakeholder groups, uh, the young people, government, uh, regional institutions, business, civil society, media, and the technical community. Thank you. Thank you, Makan. Um, Aisha, do you want to come in now before the next? Yeah? Okay, please Thank do. Thank you. Thank you. Is it working? Okay. I just wanted to build on something that Nigel brought up. I think his point is, is, is very interesting about would we be becoming too rigid. I think that having a discussion about the various types of multi-stakeholder processes and opportunities and initiatives um, is going to be helpful in getting to the principles. Um, I don't think we should be afraid to bring out the various examples. I know in preparing for our workshop that will take place tomorrow, um, workshop 41, just in case anybody wants to know. I know it came out that, you know, there is a question. And when there are national initiatives set up, if there's, for instance, uh, one business person and one academic, for some people that is multi-stakeholder. And for some people that is not. But having the discussion about, well, how effective is that? Because really it's not just about setting up something. It's about because we believe that informed policy development and, and decision making comes from having the views of all interested stakeholders. And so drilling down to see, well, what are you losing if you don't actually abide by certain principles in whatever you're setting up and calling it multi-stakeholder? Um, so I just wanted to bring that into the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Subi, would you like to uh, just spend a moment talking about principles? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for giving me the floor. My name is Subi Chaturvedi, and I teach journalism and communication at a women's college in Delhi University. Um, that's as multi-stakeholder as we will get. There's representation from 25 states of the country. Um, in terms of diversity and access issues, India is a case study by itself about 840 million mobile phones, about 160 million people online, and we're hoping to put and connect another billion. Um, there are issues, of course, with multi-stakeholderism. It is not something that is uncontroversial. It is not something that we have come to understand and agree. And I think that is a good thing. I have to thank Nigel for bringing this to our attention, that definitions and labels and compartments are not always the best way forward. I do want to, however, take a step back and, and ask these questions, and these are important questions when we talk about multi-stakeholderism. Whose voices are heard and whose voices are left out or excluded when it comes to multi-stakeholderism? These are important questions to ask. When we talk about processes, and I'll come to democracy and multi-stakeholderism in just a second, but it is also equally important to understand what is the legitimacy that each stakeholder has in terms of representing their voices and opinions. And as Aisha very rightly pointed out, sometimes we get the platform right, we get the notion right, we get the idea right by having representation but not participation. By having accountability does not come without transparency. Transparency leads to better efficiency and decision making. A collective of voices is equally important and getting as many new voices as possible in the room from developing countries, from emerging economies is an important aspect of multi-stakeholderism and which is why let us not forget to celebrate the open, bottoms-up, inclusive, transparent process that the IGF is. It is a very important moment in history and I know there are problems but I would reiterate that these are good problems to have and to solve. Um, I want to share a little experience that we had with India because it, it is just so overwhelming when you speak with young people because young people are not often always polite. They ask sharp questions and they ask pointed questions. We did about three round tables and we had voices from a thousand young leaders who came together and talked about the internet that they want. And this is the conversation 
conversation that we need to have to facilitate, when we talk about multi-stakeholderism, the Tunis Agenda, paragraph 34 in particular, talks about the rightful roles and responsibilities of each stakeholders, the private sector, the technical community, the academic community, media, youth, um, the, the industry, and governments. When we talk about governments, they have an important role to play, and it is important to understand in the state versus market debate, when ROIs are important, governments will create infrastructure in the long run that, is that will facilitate and benefit other stakeholders, and they have a huge role to play. But to differentiate between government and governance, as Aisha also pointed out, is equally important. Um, the Tunis agenda, talks about the development and application by governments, the private sector, the civil society, in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures. Though we might not agree to a definition or a common understanding of multi-stakeholderism, but both in governance as well as internet governance, it is an important concept because I don't see any other option. I don't see an option where governments can speak with governments and solve a problem which is beyond their understanding at the moment because governments please remember, did not create the internet. The internet was created by cherishing and upholding core internet values and principles of openness and permissionless innovation. And it is a community exercise. So um, I, I just want to leave it at that for the moment. We envisage this section and this session to be interactive. We want opinions, observations, and comments from the floor. Diplo carried a really interesting exercise, and that's my benchmark for understanding how we see and, and solve and respond to questions and problems differently. I just want to put the top three words that we, that we use the most often by different stakeholder communities. For governments, it was Internet, Think, IGF. For international organizations, it was Internet, Think, Very, which was followed by Much. Non-governmental organizations, Privileged, Think, Much, Very, and Person. Technical communities talked about Think, Internet, Much, and Very. Academia talked about Internet, Very, Much, Think. Business talked about Think, Much, Very, and Go. Um, these are calls to action, and this is also a small example in how we talk about similar things, but not with equal amount of importance and privileges. So I also want this opportunity to be a call to action for communities to engage, and yes, civil societies have a huge role to play. As Nina pointed out, it is important to be able to disseminate information and to be able to build bridges and facilitate greater participation. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Subi. So um, now I welcome, we welcome comments, questions from the floor. Um, I know that we have one over here. Does anybody else uh, want to get in the order to speak? Um, yep, Joy. Yeah. Matthew, sorry. Um, I, I, Matthew, um, we'd also requested a, a regional perspective, so may, may I also request Mark to share his observations during the course of the discussion? Yes, Thank yes you. absolutely. Um, who else? So I have... And then Joy and Norbert. Okay, let's start. Yes, please, go ahead. So I, I wanted to take off from where John left and wanted to say that there is systematic research that exists on multi-stakeholderism. And one of these uh, research pieces that we've been studying was uh, done by, undertaken by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, and it looked at the United Nations and uh, looked at what these uh, partnerships actually mean. And the conclusion of this research was that invariably the, the notion or the practice of multi-stakeholderism suffers from the problem of putting the cart before the horse, which is that instead of asking the question how can global problems be solved in a framework of democratic multilateralism? And in our case, we might want to say democratic 
multiculturalism, pluralism, multilingualism, and everything else, normally the question tends to degenerate into how can partnership models be strengthened and their management improved? So this is a kind of a reductionist uh, approach. And um, what the research also says is that there is no unifying goal in any of these partnerships other than the fact that different actors espousing multiple goals and different timescales are actually coming together. The research also cautions that in these arrangements, there can actually be a distortion of competition and a pretense of representativeness. It also cautions that it has dubious complementarity where governments escape responsibility on human rights. Um, well, I think I'll stop there, but just to say that this cart before the horse problem needs to be identified and one must go back to the touchstone of democracy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Could I just ask everybody to introduce themselves when they speak? Thank you. Joy? Thanks, Matthew. I wanted to just pick up on a couple of points that have been made. I think they're very useful, particularly from Aisha um, and also from, so from Subi, just in relation to these shared um, understandings of um, multi-stakeholder processes. And uh, I wanted to share an idea that arose in the in the Best Bits meeting. Um, which was to do with this uh, discussion and trying to build towards a, a shared um, understanding of multi-stakeholder principles, um, shared not only in the areas where we agree, but shared understanding of where we disagree. Um, and one suggestion uh, that has been made is that the uh, best bits begin to think about some kind of quality mark if you like, for multi-stakeholder processes, taking into account our shared understandings of, of what uh, principles we think are important in defining uh, in, in legitimate uh, multi-stakeholder processes, and whether this might be something that a cross-community a cross -community conversation would be good to, to have. Um, uh, so not only the processes themselves, but how do we share uh, and agree when we look at different processes on, on the quality of those um, and whether we can sort of assist them in some way. Um, and I think that would be an interesting concept to, to explore uh, in the context of this discussion and the IGF going forward. Thank you. Um, next we have Norbert, please. Norbert Bolo, speaking for the Civil Society Internet Governance Caucus. We have a workshop that I wanted to mention and it is very interesting as an example also for what I call incident handling. The workshop is called Multi-Stakeholder Selection Processes, Accountability and Transparency. And the incident is a, a conflict that arised out of lack of clarity, or different understandings about uh, stakeholder groupings. Um, uh, there was a breakdown of trust in the uh, whole concept and process of representativity. And the way forward that eventually crystallized is that we are organizing a workshop jointly with the three focal points for the non-governmental stakeholder categories for the CSCD Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation. And we are going to look into uh, principles that, may, that will work specifically to have accountability and transparency in a way that is trustworthy so that we can build trust that people can feel represented, not only that they are comfortable with the representatives that are sort of responsible for their kinds of concerns, but also that we can have some kind of trust in the whole system, that it, the whole system is sort of adequate to bring all the various concerns to the table. So that is today, right after the lunch break, 
number 127. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert. Leslie. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Leslie Cowley from Nominet, the UK registry, uh, and also speaking from my experience of um, working with country code colleagues over a number of years. Um, I'd like to welcome the principles. Um, uh, clearly, a lot of thinking has already uh, gone into those already. Uh, and just to add two reflections. Um, I noticed at the very end was something on decision making. Uh, and I just observed that's interesting because traditionally the IGF, as a, a multi stakeholder model, hasn't been keen on decision making. Um, so, so maybe that's new territory. But, but for me, decision making in a multi stakeholder environment can often be um, challenging. And often making a decision, one of the key aspects of decision making is making a timely decision. And if it takes forever to get to a decision, then, uh, then maybe that's not such a good thing. My second point, though, was about the wording here. Uh, and I'm lucky because English is my first language. Uh, but even though it's my uh, first language, I could still give you different meanings on some of those words. Uh, uh, and I would just suggest that maybe, assuming we can reach some agreement on words, then examples of those principles in action might be very helpful. For example, in, in terms of accountability, this is a, a, a small case study as to how this was done in a particular policy area. Uh, that might be helpful in terms of making those principles real to people and preventing different interpretations of the words. Thank you, Leslie. That's a, a, a very valuable comment, I think, and uh, an interesting way for us to possibly proceed with this. Um, I think we have one more, one more comment that would like to be made, and then um, I think we're going to need to kind of move this forward a little bit, given the constraints of time, so please. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Virat Bhatia. I um, work for AT&T and also represent a large industry association, FIKI, um, based out of New Delhi. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to um, make a point about the various models that uh, were discussed and the fact that we shouldn't try and label them uh, and to emphasize some of that stuff. Um, the there's a lot that's spoken about the uh, resilient CGI model as a success on what multi-stakeholder discussion should be. Um, let me represent in some. I can't pull this up any further. Okay, uh, but let me represent that um, in in from my experience of working for about 18 years in the Indian ICT space. Um, we don't have a body like that, but in fact, I would argue that we have a very strong, um, a, perhaps even a stronger process of engaging multi-stakeholders in decision-making that is almost written under law. Um, and in countries where the tradition for consultation, engagement, participation is weak, it is uh, sensible to put this under law. Um, I would just sort of argue, um, it just take about a minute or so, um, under the Telecom Act in India, which basically leads to decisions of the government, executive decisions of the government, not necessarily policy, both on telecommunications and which lead to internet access, etc. not only are the regulators obliged to act in a transparent manner under law, but in fact, inputs provided by stakeholders have to be considered and in the event that a party believes that the inputs have not been considered in an open, transparent process that is available through open houses and written consultation, they are able to take the decisions of the government to court and get those decisions set aside and has been done on more than one occasion. So in fact, the way to strengthen meaningful engagement of multi-stakeholders with the government when it's making decision 
as one of the models is to actually write it in law so that the government is obliged to explain its decisions and also exclusion of inputs or comments that might have been given. Now, this is not a very celebrated model around the world, but I believe, and I would argue, a very effective model. Um, in policy making, we have the same process. It's not under law, but there's open consultation. So I was just trying to strengthen the point that was being made that I think the debate about what the various multi-stakeholder models should be uh, is an evolving debate, but I suppose the basic principles hold. Um, the point that I want to emphasize upon is that when the government is making decisions, uh, it should be obliged to reflect the inputs that have been received, including the ones that have been rejected, along with assigning reasons. And that will strengthen the confidence and the process more than any other um, discussion. I'd close by saying that in countries where this is not a strong legacy or not well developed, it makes sense to put it under law to the extent possible so that recourse is available when the principles are violated. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mark, I may have missed you. Do you wish to speak? Yeah. Okay. And then we'll, we'll move on. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Mark Carvel, UK Government Department for Culture, Media and Sport. We lead on uh, internet governance uh, policy and engagement in fora like this uh, and also in the ITU when it's dealing with um, internet issues and, uh, and also in the UN and other fora where a lot of examination and um, um, the evolution of multi-stakeholder processes come up for discussion. We're very committed to getting involved in those discussions as much as possible. I just wanted to follow up, really, in, in a kind of neat segue from the last two to three um, um, interventions about uh, the UK experience here, because we, had, we do have a long, uh, well-established tradition within the UK government of consulting on any legislative proposals uh, under a number of um, well-established um, uh, mechanisms for that, the publish, publication of green papers, white papers, and so on, and generally um, being open and accessible to anybody who has an interest in a particular policy issue at the center of a, of a legislative uh, proposal. Um, in the area of internet governance, uh, we have set up a, uh, a process for consultation with stakeholders. Uh, Minister Edvesi referred to this uh, in one of his uh, speeches when he was here. Um, and that is the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group on Internet Governance. We, we, it's a new acronym. It's called MAGIG, M-A-G-I-G. And that comprises about 40 representatives from uh, across our administration because Internet uh, issues, you know, interest in other government ministries in, in respect of Internet issues is quite extensive, so we bring together those um, colleagues from other parts of government, so we're more joined up. We've got the private sector there, we've got the civil society, we've got the academic experts. So these, this group, we meet uh, with them at regular intervals. We have an agenda which is largely determined by what's happening in the internet ecosystem, um, such as the WISIS review, the prospect of the IGF, ITU preparations for the high-level event uh, next April and so on. So we've got a very busy agenda and we're saying, look, this is what's coming up. Let us know what you feel. We can do a paper about this, circulate it amongst the, uh, the members of the MAGIG and then you know, we get a better sense of confidence, exactly the point that's been made, that we're, you know, we're going in line with what stakeholders are telling us. And if we have points of difference, let's talk them through and, and uh, examine that. So at that national level, we're very active. We are very active in the European Multi-Stakeholder Forum, the EuroDIG, uh, European Dialogue on Internet Governance, EuroDIG. We contribute to that and engage in uh, discussions when EuroDIG takes place. And then in the Commonwealth, we have... Um, it's a bit of a virtual forum. We don't have standalone... Um, events as the Commonwealth IGF. We've got an open forum here in, in Bali on, on Friday morning. And there the experience has been good in terms of bringing together potential partners for initiatives, concrete actions coming out of dialogue. 
The IGF is not a decision-taking forum, but it brings together potential partners, and that is the catalyst for cooperation, again involving stakeholders. And we have uh, a major initiative on the go. We'll talk about this on, on, on Friday at our session here. Uh, and that is the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative. And there we've got all the key international partners engaged in um, capacity building to combat the threats of cybercrime. So we've got ICANN, we've got the Council of Europe, we've got the ITU, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, and, and, and many others, Commonwealth, existing Commonwealth institutions that have an interest in this, such as the Commonwealth Secretariat and the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. They're all around the table with us, and it came out of discussion, a very open discussion that we facilitated through the Commonwealth Internet Governance Forum. And I'm, I, th I think the story is looking very good on that. The dialogue, the coming together of partners, is actually leading to concrete action in a very open and accessible uh, process. So uh, I just briefly wanted to count that as an example of how dialogue involving stakeholders, governments, can actually lead to concrete actions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I see no other hands. And in the interest of time, I think we move, need to move on just to um, – let me just – just make a couple of comments. I think we've had a, a very rich discussion. Um, some themes that have come out are the imperative of diversity and geographical representation, the need for a common language, and a common understanding of what those principles that we may be working to are. There needs to be opportunity for participation, including remote participation. We talked a bit about legitimacy of purpose and how important that is, about bottom-up agenda setting, uh, clear preparatory and transparent processes um, and the legitimacy of representation and a general transparency as to what the process is and how do you contribute and what the outcomes are and what the accountability is. I think at this point um, I'd like to turn it over to Adiel and I would like to see if we can, without wordsmithing, <laughs> which is going to be very challenging, if we can come to some sense of, uh, of, um, of purpose around uh, the words that we've got up on the screen as a, a, f a first step, if you will. Um, and, and if that's agreeable, um, uh, I'd certainly like to give that a try. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to Adiel. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Matthew, and uh, <clears throat> very, very interesting indeed. Um, one thing that I've, I've noticed as well is that uh, <clears throat> globally we all are converging towards some key uh, principle of metastical, but when, when we start digging in and, and start looking at their application and start looking at their, their translation into uh, a different area of internet governance, being internet governance, policy development process um, uh, um, at country level, then the interpretation may vary. Uh, and that interpretation depends a lot on the environment and who is driving the process as well. And I think that is where the challenge is uh, for all, all of us, how can we, can we can go around that. So I think what we're going to do now, as Ma Matthew sees, is to look at those words on the um, uh, projected there and see among those world, uh, which of them can, um, um, across the border, can be uh, applied and where we see challenges as well, because one of the part of this, this um, uh, session was to look at where the challenge arose in applying those principles of, of multi-stakeholderism uh, uh, generally. So if we can look at those uh, few points, um, and see if there is or there is no convergence uh, on those principles, and if there is no, where the challenge, where is the challenge, and, and how can we uh, address them going forward? Uh, yes, John and uh, Parvinder. Yeah, John and then Parvinder. Um, okay, um, the looking at the ones on the screen before us. I just note that um, the uh, mechanisms listed for decision making and for how transparency cover how decisions are made and the inputs behind that, but it actually doesn't cover um, the documents and the materials in the discussion. So there's a question of whether or not multi-stakeholderism 
requires not just understanding how the decisions were made, but access to all of the communications. All of the inputs are available. Um, and uh, it doesn't, it's an interesting question whether or not this is an internet specific item or not, but um, it doesn't specifically talk about things like public comment and remote participation. Um, I'd like to think if multi-stakeholder mechanisms were used by another group of people solving some other problem, they'd still include uh, mandatory processes for public comment and for remote participation where feasible and without any requirements for participation in either of those other than decorum. That's it. Uh, th th thank you, John. Um, you've mentioned, excuse me, Parminder, just to comment on, on John's uh, comment. You mentioned um, a remote participation, a public comment, can, and, and availability of documents or supporting documents for the decision-making process. Can those be aggregated in transparency, for instance? They can. Presently, the language there provides processes, decision making, and decisions made and input, that actually doesn't include all of the input, just the input reflected in the decision. And so we just need to be careful there. We need to elaborate transparency a little On bit. On the wording. Thank you. I got that point. Parminder, I think I perhaps didn't make myself clear, but I reiterate and I had said this even when these principles were being developed that consensus-based decision-making in public policy is a huge political issue. And I repeat, we are talking about public policy decisions of power conflicts, structural marginalizations. I actually gave an example that slavery would not have been abolished in a consensus-based decisions. And therefore, it cannot be accepted that we tie ourselves to consensus-based decision-making in public policy process. And that has not been acceptable earlier for us, and this is not acceptable politically generally for any kind of democracies which I have been a part of. So I would like that part to be removed or said in a manner which does not make it applicable to decision-making in public policy processes. And second, as a principle, also I requested that multi-stakeholderism is seen as a form of participatory democracy and every instrument or act of multi-stakeholderism is checked whether it actually increases the power and participation of those who are traditionally left out. That for me is the biggest principle. We don't need reform in democracy if democracy is working and if multi-stakeholderism is a reform in democracy then it means it's not working and the point of it's not working is that the people ha do not have equitous political power and multi-stakeholderism is only legitimate if it increases the equity of political power. So two things, again, to be very precise so that they get incorporated. Consensus-based decision-making public policy cannot be a thing we can commit ourselves to. Second, it should be a form of participatory democracy and should be checked against whether it increases the power of marginalized groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, I think uh, the, especially the decision making, I think it's, it's, it's something very, very t tricky to, 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 to talk about and uh, I think that will be taken into consideration. Matthew, you want to add something? Perhaps um, we could take the following approach. Um, and we've got a, a, an incredibly valuable transcript going here that reflects all the various inputs that have been given so far. Perhaps we can talk about these a little bit more generally. Um, and then take into account the point that everybody's making and, and view this as an ongoing iterative process, right? So taking into account the things that people have said and, and work and view this as something going forward. And I really, I particularly liked uh, Leslie's proposal about looking at actual practices and how can we, how can we illustrate these principles through uh, actual things from, you know, that the, the are working out there or indeed the challenges aspect. So rather than Perhaps it's good to hear what I would like to, we would like to hear what people 
have concerns about. But let's, let, we're not taking this um, session as an opportunity to wordsmith. This is an ongoing process, but this is, we want to make, get a sense of the room, so to speak, and, and take this discussion forward. So let's note all the comments um, and, and take this discussion forward so towards the next IGF and, and, um, and build on the basis of what we have on the screen as a, as a starting point. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And I think there are there are many other workshops during the, this week that are going to provide input to this discussion as well. So we are not we are not going to have the final word here, but I think all the input that we have here will contribute to shape this discussion discussion for going going forward. Um, any any other comment on the challenge and and, and specific application of this? Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't have a spe specific application, um, but I would like to comment on specific applications. Uh, it seems to me that the basis of uh, your principles are that there's some kind of normative consensus among the various stakeholders. That is, the, uh, there's a convergence of the stakeholders around a, a shared set of values and norms concerning the issue at hand. Um, I think there's a problem with that. Um, when we talk about stakeholders, we're talking about interests. And in many environments and many decisions, uh, there are conflicts, of in conflicts between interests as well as con perhaps conflicts of interest, but certainly conflicts between interests. And I guess what I don't see in your principles or hasn't been raised in the discussion to date is how in this context those kinds of conflicts are managed. That is when there isn't a normative consensus, when people are pursuing their interests and you have in some sense a zero-sum game. And um, I think that's uh, perhaps getting into a, an issue that was raised elsewhere, which is the issue of, of the relationship between multi-stakeholderism and democracy. Uh, one of the um, key virtues, if you will, one of the key contributions of democracy uh, was its capacity to settle, to resolve uh, gross conflicts within society. Perhaps not to everyone's satisfaction, but at least to a uh, degree of satisficing amongst the various parties. And uh, the challenge that I see if, if uh, multi-stakeholderism is put up uh, as a decision-making process in the absence of its subordination to democratic processes uh, is that there is no means to resolve those kinds of conflicts. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we have two further comments. You and John. Thank you. Joy Lady Cope for the record. Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, repeat the earlier thought, uh, share the earlier thought we'd had about um, uh, discussion and some of the best bits list about coming up with some shared understandings that we could use to assess from a, a sort of a qualitative basis uh, multi-stakeholder processes which um, uh, we think uh, have the hallmarks of or appear to to, to be conducive, uh, uh, commensurate with, I should say, the, the principles that we're, we're sharing. And we think this would be a useful thing to, to explore. Um, and it's a new idea um, and we think it you know, would be a valuable input um, perhaps to the, to the next IGF. Um, and also something for participants in other IG-related processes to take into account in, in their own work. Um, I, I just on the consensus-based um, decision-making point, I mean, I, I understand that there are different perspectives on this, um, uh, but I wouldn't want those different perspectives to prevent us from including within decision-making um, uh, those decision-making processes that are based on consensus, uh, where there are where there is um, a uh, you know, some qualitative aspect to, to ensuring that, um, assuring, I should say, that, that consensus is genuine, fully informed, and, and uh, 
uh, resulting in um, the kinds of processes that we want. I certainly would not want to see consensus-based decision-making excluded entirely from, a, from our, our principles. I think that would be counterproductive. Um, but the point is well made about um, the quality of those, but I think that uh, that's a different issue. Thank you. Well, no, then, um, I think we'll take the last one. John, you wanted to say something, and uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, Matthew, we will take it after. Oh, there is two. There is. Okay, we take that that one first because John already. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sala uh, Tamaniko Moro, and uh, I'm from Fiji. I just thought that I could just quickly share some thoughts. I tried to be very succinct as much as possible. I think to a large extent, um, because there are different contexts within internet governance, whether it's within a policy uh, making body, whether it's within the IGF or whether it's the selection of, of certain represent, uh, representatives or constituents and that sort of thing. But I think one of the things that we should uh, include in our dialogue and in our conversation is the philosophical base. Because reality is you, you can have one person from government, you can have 10 people from civil society, you can have maybe two from corporate, but that one person can say override the room, you know? So numbers just, they, they don't solve the problem. Although they do help in terms of aggregating and ensuring a certain level of equality of voices. However, having said that, I think we should uh, focus, and this is, uh, and I'll quickly um, address the philosophical point. I think we should move away from, we should move uh, to the bigger picture as to why we're doing this and get the stakeholders to recognize that at the end of the day, it has to be people-centric. Corporates need consumers to purchase or to acquire products. Governments exist uh, to um, uh, look after global, uh, I mean, not global, to look after their citizens' interests. And at the same time, civil society is a sort of a watchdog. And so because contexts differ and that sort of thing, I would say that a value-based, values-based approach to collaboration, returning the focus to it's about the people. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, new perspective. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, John. We won't be able to take your comment, but uh, you can send them by mail if you want to, to us. Um, uh, Matthew, if you can. Uh... Um, yes, um, I, I do apologize that we have run out of time because this has been a wonderful discussion, but um, we will be here in the room. Uh, for those who would like to make a comment, we can take it um, and make sure it's reflected um, as we take this work forward, and I'd like to turn it over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Adil. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think I follow all the discussion. I examine. This is my first time also to involve in the IGF and very interesting and very difficult, of course, especially when maybe during your childhood you never understand about the value of what just uh, discussing here. And this is very important and we are lucky also like for Indonesia my colleague already mentioned that we have about 450 ethnic group. Uh, we are lucky we have the national language. That the first and the second also, the, the national language is chosen from the small ethnic group, not from the major like the Javanese. This is a kind of, let's say, respect to all. And our symbol or our foundation also, university in diversity. So therefore, we are trained, we learn, even though not the younger generation or the young generation involved and interfere, interrupted by the new culture. In Indonesia, we call that the MTV culture and the, let's say, maybe the CNN culture. So they are changing, the environment is changing. So I believe that, let's say, Bali can produce the brilliant uh, uh, thought and we can, of course, later discuss in, maybe in the special uh, dialogue regarding this. So, ladies and gentlemen, with this comment, I conclude the session on principle of multi-stakeholders cooperation. And thank you also for 
moderator Adil and Matthew, and also uh, Marcus already guide me to chair this meeting. And I wish you enjoy your stay in Bali. The longer you stay, the better for the Indonesian economy. Thank you very much.